The first question says, if one is fornicated in the past and regrets it now, what do they have to do in order to gain forgiveness? How would one go about it? And if, if unfortunately that has happened for a person, the first thing that must be remembered is that, that the door of repentance is open to everybody. The door of repentance is open to everybody. The worst sin after shirk, which is the unforgivable sin, shirk being worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the worst sin after that, the ulama have categorized is murder, is qatl, qatl al nafs, bi ghayri haq, is murder. And we have the famous hadith where a person killed 99 people, then he went seeking out the mercy of Allah for repentance. He goes to a learned person who tells him the door's closed, so he kills him as well. 100. <laughs> you got to be careful how you answer with the man. <laughs> so then he seeks out another learned person who tells him the door of mercy is open. So the door of mercy, you know, murder is a worse sin than fornication, which is also considered from, from the Kabbalah, from, from the most grievous sins. But the door of, of repentance is open. But here now, like, like the questioner asks, what, what you, how do you go about it? How do you go about it? Here we need to look at shurut at tawbah, the conditions of tawbah. And tawbah here is not just that you make a sense, a stalf for Allah, a stalf for Allah, a stalf for Allah. That can be just a, a, a statement in your tongue. What we need is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tawbu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with an acceptance, a complete repentance. <coughs> Turn to Him completely. We have many important shurut of tawbah. Amongst the, mo amongst the most important conditions of repentance which applies here, the first is, is that you have absolute conviction and resolve that you will never commit that act again. If, you, if somebody lies and they make tawbah and then they know full well they're going to do the same again, you say you're mocking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're, you're not truthful in your claim that you, that, that you want to repent. And you, if that person was fornicating and she's still hanging out with that guy, you say, what type of, what type of repentance is that? Like what does that first one now necessitates that you cut off whatever means has caused you to do that act? Like, like so, so when you say that, when somebody say that they fornicate, you say, okay, you made tawbah. Have you got connect, have you got contact with that guy? If you have, it's going to happen again. That's not sincere tawbah. Tawbah means you cut off and you have no connection whatsoever with whatever caused it. No. Another important condition of tawbah is a nadama that you have remorse and you feel pain in your heart that you've used yourself and you've, and you've rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't just think that I can say astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. It should pain you in your heart that you've committed that act. And that pain should <coughs> remain in your heart until your dying day. What did Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab say? That a person only loses his Islam when he forgets his jahiliyyah. When he forgets his jahiliyyah. Once you become comfortable with the way that you used to be before, when you weren't practicing or when you were not a Muslim, then there's an easy chance you will lose your faith. Um, it's only when you realize the pits that you were in back at that time, when you start realizing how foul and how filthy and how, how, how bad it was, if you keep that in your mind all the time, that's when you'll you keep on top of your faith. You don't, you don't let complacency, complacency set in. 
So, so the real answer to this is tawbah, but it's tawbah which is iqla' min ad that you cut yourself off completely from whatever was causing that. And then inshallah, you have husnul dhan billah. You have a good, you have a good, if you fulfill those conditions, you have a good opinion of your Lord. You have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu because He is the way that you perceive Him to be. If you fulfill these conditions of repentance, particularly that you've cut off any contact with that individual, and then you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa He will turn to you. He will turn to you and He will open the doors of His mercy to you. And provided your niyyah is genuine, you will not fall back into that ever again. What were the four things that get in, in between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nafs, shaitan, dunya? The four most people, bad company around you. One of, one of the destructive, destructive ways, bad company uh, um, around you. That's what Allah subhanahu wa warns us in the, in the last surah of the Quran. الَّذِي يُوَسْلِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ وَالنَّاسِ Those who whisper and put ideas into your mind from the jinn as well as people. You have shayateen al-ins as well as shayateen al-jinn. Allah subhanahu wa refers to the Qur'an as human satans. <coughs> human satans. What's the role of a satan? To mislead you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Human beings can do that just as effectively as jinn can do it. So when you're sitting down and you're ready to pray and somebody's telling you, your best mate's telling you now, sit down, come on, what we're doing and so on. Shaitan. Shaitan. He's whispered you and led you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that person's coming and telling you to come and meet that girl, shaitan. That person is shaitan. You say, A'udhu billahi minka. I take refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from you and from the foul thoughts that you're placing in front of me. So the fourth and, and one of the damaging hurdles between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the people that he keeps company with. Quite often you find that the case that when a person says they want to make tawbah, they want to change their ways, they want to start practicing, you say, look what's around you. Look what's around you. If the people around you are still the way you were before, that's going to hold you back. That's going to hold you back. The people, you want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most powerful way that's, that, that is is suhbat as salihin is keeping the company of righteous people because they will lift you just as those people, those bad people will pull you down the righteous people will, will pull you up Ibn Ata'illah in his hikam he says صُحْبَةُ الْأَخْيَارِ تُورِثُ حُسْنَ الظَّنِّ بِالْأَشْرَارِ وَصُحْبَةُ الْأَشْرَارِ تُورِثُ سُوءَ الظَّنِّ بِالْأَخْيَارِ the company of good people produces within you a bad opinion so the company of good people produces within you a good opinion of the worst of people. The company of bad people produces within you a bad opinion of the best of people. You have some people, they'll talk ill of ulama, of salihin, they'll talk ill, they'll talk bad about righteous people. Why? What's around you? What's around you? But then you, you see somebody who's foul in nature, he's doing all types of harm, but he's making an excuse for that person. That perhaps this is what's happened, perhaps that's what happened, perhaps that's affected them in their life. Well, he's making he's making 70 excuses for him. Why? Because he's got good people around him all the time. who are inspiring him and encouraging him to do good deeds. So the people around you has a has a very very powerful effect upon the way that you live your life. What did the Prophet do around women that were not his wives? Well we can definitely say he didn't do haram, nor did he do makruf. He never dealt with a woman in a haram manner. He never shook hands with a woman. He was never alone with a woman. He's walking with his wife, with one of his wife, I think, say the Sauda, and, and there's a person looking, and he says, this is my wife. Yeah, we, we can't doubt you. But what's he telling you? What's he telling you? And you have to caution. On these matters where people can start having a bad opinion of you, you're dealing with that, sister. she's just a friend. She's just a friend. What are, what are, people, going to start, what are people going to start now attributing to you? And your irad is sacred with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your honor, your reputation is sacred with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, you're just a friend. Nobody sees you just as a friend, just a friend with that person. Prophet never, he dealt with people at a natural level. And what we should not do, one of the unfortunate things we have now, we live in a time of extremes. We live in a time of extremes. You have religious extremes. And you have extremes within kufr. You have extremes both sides. Religious extremes, you find very few people who are on the way of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the moderate, not moderate as they, as they label, and the way of I'tidal, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Ummatan Wasata, the middle path, 
That's the way of the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah. We find so few people upon that way. People who practice the religion go to extremes. People who don't practice it go to extremes within the liberalism and the, and the haram and kufr and that they, they, go, they go to extremes. And what we see, what, Prophet was not a person of extremes. It wasn't in his nature to be extreme. In anything he did, there was nothing extreme about him. Likewise, in terms of how he de dealt with the opposite gender, if there was a need to deal with him, he would deal with him. If there wasn't a need, he would, he would leave him. But he, he kept that, he maintained that caution. The women used to pray behind in the message of the Prophet. Not an issue, like sisters sit at the back there, not an issue. But what did they do? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The women would leave. The men wouldn't turn around until the women had left. The women, women would leave at that point. So there was no unnecessary, unnecessary contact between the males and the females. So the Prophet dealt with them. He dealt with them as Allah subhanahu required to him. Allah subhanahu told the Prophet as well as the believers, غُدُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غُدُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُدُّونَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجِهُمْ Tell the believers, lower your gaze and protect your, your modesty. Is he not going to do that? He's going to be the first and foremost to do that. So when you say, how did he deal? He dealt with them in a natural manner, but he never engaged haram. Natural means that if there was a need, he would deal with them. He, he was not somebody who used to run away, as, as some people become impractical in this, that they'll have no contact whatsoever. We say, no, if there's a need, you deal with it. If not, like another question that comes up, how do you deal with lecturers who are from the oxygen? At, at a natural level. It's not suddenly that you run away from everything. And one of the, one of the syndromes you get amongst Muslims with the sisters, I, I can never look at him, I can't touch But when, when they're dealing with a non-Muslim, not a problem whatsoever. <laughs> I said, be natural about these things. Be, be careful with the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never transgress the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be alone. Don't be, don't be touching. Don't be doing anything that's haram. But at the same time, be natural about these things. Because what starts happening when you go to extreme, it produces something unnatural within you. You lose itma'nan fil qalb. You lose... Like what's, what's the sign of truth? What's the, what's the fruits of Iman? Is that you have you a sense of I mean, um, solitude within you internally. You have an inner peace within you. You have an inner peace, and that starts changing that, and that starts disturbing that. So we say, I mean, halal is bayin, haram is bayin. Halal is clear, haram is clear, but deal with these things naturally. We don't need to go extremes in these matters. So that's why the next question, a few of these questions interlinked. Is it halal to interact with a group of girls in a public place? If there's a need, yes. If there's a need, yes. If there's no need, then we say it remains in the original haram. Because remember, there's something that we didn't mention. All of what's halal and ha what's haram in all of this, all of it is underpinned by one ayah in the Quran. I, I got an email as some Arab teacher, female, was telling people that you don't need to worry about all of this. This is all thing that was introduced by culture. There's no problem having joint gatherings where you mix together, men and women sitting, sitting together, all of it's okay. Because she said there's no delay whatsoever in the Quran and Sunnah that you should be separate and you should maintain your boundaries. So that, that woman is jahil bi kitabillah. First of all, she's ignorant about the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet Because the clear eye in the Quran, la taqrabu zina. Everything now comes from that. La taqrabu zina. Do not approach fornication. Do not approach illicit relationship. Approach here. لا تقرب الزنا The approach here is prohibited, not the act itself. Not the act. Allah subhanahu wa did not say لا تزنو. He said don't approach it. So anything, and here we take a qa'id of fiqhir out of this. We take a principle. Anything that leads you to haram is haram. So we say, why is it looking at the face of a woman and you get some desire out of it's haram? Because of where it could lead to. Why is it shaking a hand is haram? Because of where it could lead to. Why is it being alone is, is haram? Because of where it could lead to. Why is it just sitting around and having a chat with that woman is haram? Because of where it could lead to. You say, no, I can control myself. You're lying. You're lying. Particularly the man. If the man says that, he's lying. <laughs> the woman may be, but the man is lying. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set all of these boundaries because he knows you. He knows you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخُلِقَ man, human, man has been created weak. And the Mufassirin say, in relation to women. So if you're saying, I'm okay, there's a problem with you then. That's why we say, your nafs and shaitan has got, has got over you. Waswas anik shaitan. Shaitan's put ideas into him and then I'm okay here. I, I'm, nothing's going to happen. You hear too many cases where things happen. You hear too many cases where things do happen. Because of the original contact that, that took place. 
So you say, if there's a need, then, then, there's, then there's not a problem. But beyond the need, we say we go back to the original, <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't approach it. And if you say, I'm not to Is there even a trade? Is it ever? Uh, is it ever a trade-off between your akhlaq and what is recommended? And in the Quran it says, "Tell the believer men to lower the gaze and interact with non-Muslim women. They may find it offensive if there is no eye contact." And here, here, that's the point we're saying about behaving naturally. Behaving naturally. Yeah. I mean, clearly that's going to cause a problem. Yeah. In terms of akhlaq, we shouldn't view that as a trade-off here. Now here, we don't want people to start going away with a bad opinion of Islam. Because we're living amongst Muslims, da'wah should be foremost in our minds. The way we interact with non-Muslims should be, the form, should be in the form, foremost in our minds is that whenever I interact, there's always an opportunity that that person can come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, none of us do that. We deal with Muslim, non-Muslims all the time. If your niyyah is there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will manifest the results because you don't guide people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides. You're the seven, you're just the means. Problem is we don't have the niyyah. We look at that, it's just a kafir. He's just a kafir. Uh, he's just destined to hellfire. You might not say it, but we think that way. They're just kafir. That kafir could be a Muslim. Sayyidina Umar Abdullah one time was just a kafir. Sayyidina Ali one time was just a kafir. Alhamdulillah, the Prophet didn't look at them that way. We should view every single non Muslim as a potential Muslim. Every single non Muslim is a potential Muslim. Our problem here, living in non Muslim land, when, when Islam went to Malaysia and Indonesia, the Far East, how many people did it take? Famous story, five traders from Yemen, from Hadramaut, they went. What did they take with them? Akhlaq. They were not even ulama, they were not scholars. They didn't take a whole bad load of knowledge. The way they interacted with people, five people brought a whole nation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've got two million Muslims here, we've driven a nation away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've driven a nation away. EDL was set up because of Muslims. Now that they're swearing at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's to blame? Muslims. You say these are just kafirs. The Muslims started it. Every time they insult Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that you Muslim have to answer for that yawm qiyamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't insult their gods. Don't insult their gods in case they turn around and insult your God. They've done exactly that. Because we insulted them, we insulted them. And the da'wah has to be foremost in our mind. And a dua in the Quran, لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا Our Lord, do not make us a, a tribulation for the unbelievers. Our Lord, do not make us a tribulation for the unbelievers. Some of the ulama, the, the, the commentators of the Quran, the Mufassirin say, the meaning of this, do not make us a barrier between the unbeliever coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're a barrier. We are now a barrier to people coming to Islam. Uh, it's a statistic. Fact here in England, the cities where you've got the least converts, the cities where you've got the most Muslims. Direct correlation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I mean, you want that one, the solution, get rid of the Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> you want them to come stand, get rid of the Muslims. Somebody asked me how to be that one, say, send them all out of this country and start all over again. <laughs> EDL's probably right to ship them all out and start all over again. <laughs> We're going to sign up for EDL, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that in mind, what's your opinion on the niqab? Because a lot of people see that. It's like just, just coming back to this point, and here the point is, before, first and foremost, that one is the most significant thing. It should be in our mind. But that one does not mean we break the, we break the ahkam of Allah. It does not justify haram. It does not justify haram. Da'wah should not involve us doing haram acts. So here, are you dealing with a non-Muslim woman? Be natural about it. Be natural about it. I mean, in truth, you lower your gaze with a non-Muslim, far more haram you're going to look at. It's better to look at the face. Than to look at. <laughs> right? <laughs> better to look at the face and just say, Audi Billah, as you're doing that. <laughs> so, I'll come back to that point. Come back. How do you deal with lecturers and teachers who are female or opposite gender? Exactly the same. Be natural about these things. Be natural about these things. One thing to point out though, if you know that you have <coughs> desire in terms of dealing with that person, then, then don't deal with that person. Don't deal with that person. Um, even if she's non Muslim, you find her very attractive and you know it's going to cause problems, don't deal with that person. Look at ways to avoid being in that situation. 
Now here I want to clarify a point because I realise I said something which was inappropriate. You mentioned it insignificant sunnahs. There is no sunnah that's insignificant. That was a bad choice of words. You say insignificant, not insignificant, you know, in terms of the wider picture, there are different degrees within sunnah. Now we can say that was the most important sunnah because he was sent to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Akhlaq, character of the messenger. When you talk about like the type of clothes the Prophet had, he didn't call you to wear a certain clothes. He didn't call you to do that. That's if you want to do it out of love for the messenger, then do it. His hairstyle, there's no hadith that mentions that keep your hair the way that I keep it. The beard is mentioned as an order, but the hairstyle, and all of these kind of things, a lot of these things, the ulama say he did it as an Arab. It was a culture of his people. Although we don't negate them, they're all sunnah. And every single thing that he does, he does, there's something for us to take out of it. But as the questioner says, and the beard, for example, it's wajib to keep a beard. It's wajib to keep a beard. Yeah. Although there's a difference amongst the fuqaha over the length of the beard, it's wajib to keep to keep a beard. Yeah. So, so some 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 is are more significant than others, but nothing is insignificant. Nothing that the Prophet did was ever insignificant. In today's society, how do we avoid interaction with males, e.g., work environment? And in work environment, is a difficulty. Because work is fard upon men. A man has to work. It's an obligation upon a man to work. Yeah. Although it's not an obligation upon a woman. But on a man, it's an obligation upon a man to work. Yeah. If he has to be in that situation, then it's unavoidable. And, and there's a qa'ida, a rule amongst the fuqaha, amongst the jurists. Al-darurat al mahdurat Necessity legitimizes haram acts. You're allowed... And it's not only allowed, it's fard upon you. If you're dying of starvation to eat pork that's in front of you, it's not that you're allowed, it's fard upon you at that point. You can't refuse to eat that and say, I'd rather die than such poor. If you die in that state, Masruq, the students of Sayyidah Aishwala says, if a person dies in that state, knowing full well, he dies as an earthen, as a sinner. So, yani, that's something like fundamentally haram eating pork. So we say if you're in if you're in the office environment where there's haram interaction take place, we say try and minimise it. Like, like if you know that certain haram practice take place, like you don't go out like you don't go out to places that they'll go out to afterwards. You don't just sit around the canteen while they're all flirting and, and, and doing haram and so. Avoid. But where you have to be, you have to be. Whatever your work necessitates, that that um, it's required. The other question about is texting males haram. <laughs> <laughs> Depends why why a person's doing. It. If the purpose is haram, then it's haram. If it's because of some need to get into contact with somebody for a particular need, then then not necessarily. But if if there's no reason to do it, then we say yeah, it would become haram. If you like the girl, how would you ask them to marry you? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> if you're a close friend. If you're close friends with the male considering them for marriage, is it allowed to meet them if there's a female chaperone present? You're gonna have this you're gonna have this session about marriage. Yeah, inshallah. How far away is it? Uh, two weeks, three weeks. Okay, we'll leave it to that. I'll be answered in that session. Sheikh Ahmed Jamil, you'll answer those questions. But one thing just just to point here, the fact that you're considering somebody does not make haram halal. Even if you're engaged, haram does not become halal. Even if you're engaged, haram does not become halal. The only point where haram or where halal is not halal is when the marriage contract is taking place. Only then, because even though you're engaged six months down, the marriage is due to is scheduled to take place. What happens if it breaks in six months and you got close to them? I know of many cases where they got close to each other because they got engaged or even before engagement, and then the marriage never happened. It's finding it too hard now to separate from her finding it too, too hard because he's, he's built up this emotional bond. He can't consider anybody else, but he knows for where it's not going to happen. That's the danger that happens here where you make haram halal even though it still remains haram until the moment that the contract has taken place, that the actual marriage has taken place. Is niqab far? I didn't say it was far. I didn't say what's I your opinion. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, well, what's your opinion on it given that some like non-Muslims consider it offensive if a woman's covered from like all face? First of all, we have to understand that there's no ikhtilaf about hijab. There's no discussion about hijab. Hijab is fard, bi hukmi Allahi, or bi hukmi Rasulullah. There's no arguments about that. 
If a woman does not wear hijab, it's the same as a, a man or a woman who doesn't pray. They're in a state of disobedience. You have rahmah towards them, we call them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about being overbearing towards people in, who, who are in a state of sin. We try and bring them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that person should never try and justify the sin that they're committing. One of the problems that happened, I think it's died down a bit now, but a few years back, there was this big media campaign that hijab is just a cultural phenomenon. It was there before Islam and it's, it's not really to do with Islam. You say, if a Muslim believes that, that's kufr. If a Muslim says that it's nothing to do with religion, it just got incorporated. It may well have been there before Islam. It may well have been there, but you've been ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover yourself. Yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihim. It's in Surah Al Nur, it's in Surah Al Ahzab. Clear. Likewise, the statement of the Prophet is clear. So there's no issue, there's no debate about the, about the hijab. And you should remember that. Go back 50 years back, there was never a debate amongst the Muslims. There was never, there was never an issue amongst the Muslims. This is also a phenomenon of non Muslim society affecting Muslims. And unfortunately, that spread into Muslim lands as well. No. Like, the, like women taking off the hijab is a direct influence of living in non-Muslim society. But what, what, what Muslims should be careful of is justifying haram. Because in Aqeedah we say that, as Imam Al-Tahawi states in his section of Aqeedah, he says, لا نكفر مسلما بذنبي ما لم يستحله We never say a Muslim is a kafir based upon a sin that he commits. We never, that Muslim drinks alcohol, that Muslim fornicate, that Muslim doesn't pray, we don't call them kafir. Provided they do not justify it. The moment you justify it, you've rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we say, now, you're, now your iman is in jeopardy. The niqab is an issue about which is an ikhtilaf amongst the fuqaha. Some people are, are rigid on this. There's a debate amongst the jurists about this. No. Those who follow the Hanif Madh, the original opinion in the Hanif Madh was that it wasn't required. The later scholars said it was required. Shafi Madh, it's required. Madhul Imam Malik said it wasn't required. There's a debate amongst the jurists over this, so it's not something that's, that's qat'a, it's not something that's unquestioned. But again here we say niqab, although some people now say covering the face was something that was pre-Islam, the Romans did it, the ancient Egyptians did it, the Arabs before Islam. Say even if they did it, even if they did, the Prophet that there is mention of covering up, the wives of the Prophet when they covered up, they have to be in wara'i hijab from behind the veil. So there is references to it, but is it agreed upon? No. The fact that now here about non-Muslim, that is something to consider. That is something to consider here about how non-Muslims uh, would deal with it, particularly for a Muslim woman who's concerned about da'wah, which is our primary concern. Because remember, hukum shari, this is another justification for, justification for the EDL now. <laughs> it's haram for Muslims to live in non-Muslim lands. Right? No difference amongst the fuqaha. What's the only thing that validates it? The only thing that allows you to remain here, niyyat al-da'wah. You have an intention of spreading the message of Islam. If you do not have that mention, intention, leave. Leave. You've got no right to be You're in a state of sin to be to be in such a land. No. So every single Muslim has to have that near within their heart. That I'm interacting with that non-Muslim, hoping that they will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how and, and, and the ahkam now we look at it, particularly where there's scope to deal with it, particularly where there's scope, where there's, where there's difference amongst the jurors, where there's no arguments, we, we don't bend the rules. We don't bend the rules. We don't compromise our religion. Our religion, even though, like we see Christians now, because of the onslaught of secularism against religion, people, Christians are willing just to jeopardize and throw away the whole of the religion. We do not bend in our... Those things that are concrete, we do not bend in those. Those things with a scope for a different opinion, we can deal with that. Alhamdulillah.